Hello, everybody. Good evening. Welcome. This is our first event for the 2023 Our Community Reads season. Yay. We're in our sixth year. Yay. Um, and we're starting off with a bang with the author talk, so we couldn't be happier. Uh, my name is Denise Ward. I'm with the Friends of the Abtos Library, and I want to say thank you to the Capitola Friends, to Tony back there who's knitting, uh, for organizing this event. Um, and a special thanks to Sarah and Rowan, our IT team. They put in a lot of work um, handling all the reservations, all the technical stuff. Yeah, it's really a lot. Um, if you are, I don't know if they told you this already, but if you are zooming in right now um, and you are doing our passport, the secret code for tonight's event is, is PROSE, P-R-O-S-E. So people who are doing the passport and attend live get a sticker and, or a stamp rather, and if you are Zooming in virtually, you get a secret code. And um, if you complete, if you get stamps or codes on all 11 events that are highlighted in the passport, you get a special prize. Um, before I introduce the moderator, one other thing I wanted to draw your attention to is the real Mary Coin. Um, when this book was selected, not many of us were aware of the fact that Florence Owens Thompson, the real Mary Coyne, spent time in our area and was actually buried in Scotts Valley. Um, so we love to do things that attract, you know, our local audience, but we, we didn't know that. Um, so we do have some articles um, and there's tons of stuff on Wikipedia, too. So now you'll probably be motivated to check that out. So our moderator for this evening is Janifa Jonker. She is a very popular, I've heard, um, professor at Cabrillo College in the English department. So welcome and thank you. Thank you, Denise. So I am delighted to be here as a moderator for this inaugural event for the season and so happy to have this live audience as well as an audience in our Zoom gallery, and they will be able to ask questions as well when we get to our Q&A by putting their questions in the Q&A box. And I'm so honored to moderate this conversation with the author of Mary Coyne. Mary Coyne is a character and a book to fall in love with. It just settles in your pores and stays there. I think. And it is a New York Times bestseller. It was also the winner of the 2013 Southern California Independent Booksellers Award. To quote the New York Observer, Mary Coyne tells the intersecting stories of Vera Dare, a photographer modeled on Dorothea Lang, and Mary Coyne, a half Cherokee woman based on Florence Owens Thompson, who inadvertently became an icon through Lang's famous 1936 photograph, Migrant Mother. Now from her home in Los Angeles, we are lucky to have Mary Coyne's author, Marissa Silver, joining us this evening over Zoom. Marissa Silver has won multiple prizes for her short fiction and novels. And her most recent work being The Mysteries in 2021. In Mary Coyne, her narrator says of photographer Vera Dare, the uniqueness of her vision was at once obvious and astonishing. And indeed the same could be said of the author. Welcome, Marissa. I understand you're going to read us an excerpt from the book. I am. First of all, I wanna thank you for having me and oh. thank everyone at the library. It's really a thrill to be chosen for a community read like that. It's a very special thing and, and uh, I really appreciate it. And it's especially special for this book to be chosen by you in the area where you are because that is really the land of this book. So thanks to everyone for, for allowing me to be here with you. Um, I am going to start by reading a couple pages. Um, this book is told in different sections from different point of views. And I'm gonna start with the um, first section that. Uh, introduces us to the character of Mary Coyne. Um, this takes place in the town of Tahlequah, Oklahoma in 1920, and Mary is a teenager. 
Her mother told her that she watched people too hard. It's like you're a robber trying to break inside a person's skin, Dora said, as she threw a ball of dough against the table and attacked it with her big hands and the strength of her broad shoulders. It makes you strange. I'm not strange, Mary said. Although she liked the idea that she, that she might come to possess Toby unawares simply by the power of her gaze. She watched him in the next field over, guiding the horse and plow through the rows, the dirt turning dark as he passed, as if he were pulling a blanket over the raw earth. She watched him hoist bales of hay, wondering how his rattlebone frame could counter the weight of the dried grasses. Toby Coyne, that sickly boy, as all the mothers referred to him for years, shaking their heads sadly, as if already committing him to a collective memory. He'd managed to outwit all expectation just by staying alive, beating back whooping cough and measles and scarlet fever so that he became that miracle boy as well. Mary saw how people looked at him in town, their eyes narrowing as if they didn't trust that he was quite human. His cheeks were sunken below their bones and Mary sat in church and thought about tracing those sharp ridges with her finger and then her tongue. As the preacher exhorted the congregants sitting shoulder to shoulder on the hard wooden benches to believe against the odds of bad planting seasons and poorer harvests, telling them they should feel special for having been chosen by God to withstand his insults, she felt something reach down to the deepest part of her, as if an unseen hand were touching her there, the way she sometimes touched herself at night, holding her breath, careful not to wake Betsy and Louise, who lay next to her in the bed, or her brothers who slept on the other side of the house's single room. All the land, acres of rich chocolate dirt and golden lashes of wheat, the blue cooks and hills tangled with trees and networks of undergrowth, and the Ozarks, which seemed to marry a mountain range big enough to cover the world. Yet in their churches and homes, in their schools, and even in their beds, people were always huddled in a bunch as if they had, as it, as if they had to mass together against the threat of too much freedom. Doris gathered the flattened yellow disc into a ball and pounded it with the meat of her fist. Do this three times, she said, three, three times, not two. Should I write that down, Mary said? Don't be smart. That's not likely. Mary knew how to read and write, and Mrs. Pettit told her she was the best at math in the whole class. But now that she was 16, her mother had pulled her out of school. As far as Doris was concerned, Mary knew nothing of any real use. Someone will shoot you for looking at them that hard, or worse, Doris muttered. What worse? But Mary knew the answer. She could tell that her mother sensed something moist and wanting in Mary's parted lips. You trying to catch flies, she'd say, when the two of them walked into town to buy supplies. Mary was narrow-hipped with barely a chest, but it was something else about her that caught men's attention, a sultry drag to her gait, as if she were waiting for someone to step into her path and make her change directions. Her mother was right, she looked hard. She watched the men who walked into the last house was sat at the edge of town, far enough from the stores and saloon, the hotel and the two churches that it resembled a child excluded from a schoolyard game. Men entered the door, their shoulders bent low as if they were expecting some unseen hand to yank them away from their sinful intention. She watched those same men when they came out again too, their mouths as soft as bruised pears, their eyes adjusting to the shock of the white light of the high summer day and their sudden exposure. She watched the boys she knew at school who were nearly men now, a state of almost which made what they had been and what they were becoming tantalizingly present at the very same time. The being of a thing was most powerful when it was seconds from extinction, a flower about to drop from its stem, a shot rabbit twitching its last. She looked at the way those boys walked down the street their inward turning toes lending their movements the same lumbering intensity of a baby just learning to walk. But it was Toby Coyne who drew her eyes the most. Thanks. Lovely, yes. So now we get to ask questions. And I want to remind those uh, joining us over Zoom that you can put questions in your Q&A box at the bottom of your screen, and Rowan will hand those to me in the moment. But we'll start with uh, questions from our live audience. And I'm going to start with one myself, actually. So I have a, a question that's sort of the chicken or the egg kind of question. But I'm wondering which came first, the photo of migrant mother 
or the photographer um, that you named Vera Dare, or was there a different seed that initially drew you to tell this story? Um, that's a great question because the answer is um, they both came at the very same time. Um, I had seen that photograph, of course, multiple times throughout the course of my life. I mean, it was in the history book. It's sort of the iconic photo of the depression. So it's evoked whenever the depression is evoked. Um, and then about, I guess, I wrote this in 2013. So about three years before that, I had gone to a museum exhibit in New York. Um, and that photograph was in the exhibit. It was an exhibit of California photography. And I was drawn to it again. It's kind of a magnetic image. The woman's face is so powerful. Um, and I looked at the photograph and then I read the curator's information card next to it, which said that the woman in the photograph had not ever revealed her identity until she was old and um, sick with cancer and she needed money for health care. at which point her children had a, a, a reporter come out from the local paper and do a story about her, hoping that they could get some fundraising going for her health care. And I found that uh, piece of information sort of stunning. I mean, not only that she, uh, well, primarily that she never took credit for being the woman in arguably one of the most famous American photographs of the 20th century. Most of us would be saying, that's me, that's me, right? Mm -hmm. So it made me think, why? You know, why, why did she not take credit for that? Why did she not care that people knew that she was the woman in that photograph? And, um, you know, novels and stories for me always begin with questions um, mm -hmm. that intrigue me. And um, I write the novels not to necessarily answer the question, but to explore the question and to think about all the ramifications of that question. So we'll never know the answer of why she didn't um, reveal her identity, but I hope that the book to some degree explores the possibilities of that question. Absolutely, absolutely, thank you. So yes, we have a question over here and here we go. This, uh, this mic is for uh, the uh, oh, okay. Zoom. So obviously this required a lot of research. Um, how did you do it? You know, some idea of how you did it and approximately how long that research took. Sure, um, it did. And, you know, I have a, I, I think when I uh, think about novels and research, one of the things I often think about is um, what is the point of the research? The point is obviously to um, give a veracity to, to the time and the place that you're writing about. But it's also, for me at least, a way of um helping a character come alive on a page. So, you know, of course I read about that period and those places and I read about, you know, to some degree the situation the economic situation, but what I found most powerful to use in the research were the really small kind of granular bits of of detail that would enhance my characters' lives. So, you know, Mary Coyne, the character doesn't know about the economics of the depression necessarily, or she knows a very schematic idea. So that wasn't information that was important to for me to put in the book. What she knows is how much money she makes, how much money she needs, how is she, she gonna keep her children's clothes clean when she can't wash them all the time? What does it feel like to ride in a car whose brakes, who's you know unsprung? The seats are unsprung. So those were the kinds of details um, that I really searched out so that I could get a sense of how my character existed in that time, not just the time in general. Mm. Great. Okay, and another question from the floor. I have a question that was handed to me and it's how does your early career as a filmmaker inform your work as a novelist? Um, you know, it's funny, less and less now that I'm almost, I don't know, 30 years away from that career. But at the beginning, I stopped making films when I was 30. And so I would say at the beginning of my writing career, which followed right after, um, a lot of the craft things that I was exploring with film became really relevant. For instance, you know, when you think of film editing, how you place scenes against one another, where when you cut to one person saying something or another person saying something, there's a kind of it's not a one-to-one -one relationship, but there are ways in which there are 
um, those things are analogs. And so I think that I, um, I certainly used a lot of the thinking that I'd done about film craft in terms of, um, as I began to learn about uh, literary craft. Um, and, and I guess certainly a visual sense. Um, I think that, uh, you know, a lot of what I experienced as a filmmaker in terms of visualizing scenes um, to tell the story was something that I brought to my work. And I still think it's in my work and that I try not to sort of say, tell, but I try to show a little bit. So finding the, the actions and the behavior that can get across an idea rather than having to, to sort of um, explicitly write the idea. And that's, that comes from my experience in film for sure. Yeah. Yeah. That makes sense. Okay. Anything else from the floor for now? Yes. I, I, I can come to you or you can come to me. <laughs> okay. Uh, one of the things that uh, Florence Owens Thompson did not want to be viewed as was as a victim. And uh, how, how did you translate that into the book, into the character of, of uh, Mary? Yeah, I mean, I felt that very strongly without knowing that. Um, because who would want the the kind of um, the, because of the way that the world reacted to that photograph, it kind of created a box around her identity, right? So she couldn't be all she wasn't known as the the fullness of herself to the world. She was known as this one thing. Um, and so I think that in um, writing her, I, I tried very much to create a character from the inside out and not think of her the way the world would thought of her in terms of this iconic, uh, you know, uh, poor woman in the depression, right? That's the way people look at the photograph. And I didn't think of her that way at all. I thought of her as a woman who, uh, from, from her teenage years to her death, as a woman who experienced the fullness of life, the love of a, of a man, um, an incredible uh, uh, love for her children, an incredible work ethic. I mean, the amazing thing to me about Florence Owens Thompson, I mean, among the many amazing things, was that she survived and that her children survived. Um, and so that to me said, this is an incredible woman. This is hardly a victim. This is a survivor who, you know, had the strength to carry um, many, many children through this really challenging time with almost nothing. So um, I think I, I was very conscious of that. I mean, in general, you know, I don't ever look at characters from the outside. I don't judge them. I just try to figure out what they're thinking and feeling in given situations. But with her particularly, because she had become this kind of symbol of poverty during a particular time in history, which is not who she was. Thank you for asking that question. I appreciate that. Mm. I, I have to ask a, a follow-up question to that uh, because we haven't talked about Vera yet. Is Vera a sympathetic character? Well, you know, that is a, a word that is a really challenging word for me. Right? <laughs> yes, I, 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 I'm pro I, I realized that. <laughs> um, I, I think she's a, I don't really think about whether characters are nice or not nice or whether I agree with their actions or I don't agree. I really try to think about a character who is fully embodied so that the things that she does make sense given her nature and given her circumstance. Um, so I don't, you know, that's not a kind of judgment that I lay on my characters. And I don't ask my characters to be sympathetic because I'm not sure what that means to everyone, you know, I, I, and in order to make someone broadly sympathetic, you would have to basically iron out any interesting things about their personality. I mean, not one of us is broad, <laughs> is broadly sympathetic to everyone that we meet. So right. um, it's not really, um, it's not, it's not something that I, I think about. What I think about is, have I created a character who comes alive on the page? Have I created a character whose behavior sometimes surprises? but is, um, is consonant with her nature and with the pressures that are put upon her. Um, in the same way that, you know, I think about any real person in my life, I think, you know, they may be doing something that I find surprising, but I try to understand what the nature of that choice is and how it has to do with that person in a, in a situation of pressure. 
So um, I'm not, you know, so that that's how I feel. I mean, I, I, yeah. I think sometimes when we demand characters be sympathetic, we're, we're asking them not to um, sort of act differently than we think people ought to act, mm. right? We're saying this is the best that a person can be. And so I want this person to behave that way so that I can like her. But I don't think that's a, the obligation of fiction. No. And I don't think that if we think about our favorite characters in fiction, that's what they're trying to do. And that's what the mm. authors are trying to do with them. I think that's not the obligation. Yeah, I think that's perfect because Patrick tells her at one point that she's kind mm -hmm. and she um, that that really kind of uh, gets her thinking. And so uh, I like the fullness of that response. Thank you so much. You're welcome. I'm wondering if we have a um, some questions from the Zoom gallery we could consider. OK, so Jen asks. Have you met or communicated with Florence Owens Thompson or her family to learn more about her? Now, um, I, I she died. At, she passed away in 1982. So right. I'm assuming so not, not so. But her. Um, and I did not meet any members of her family. I didn't seek them out um, because I was writing an imaginative piece of fiction, and I did not intend to write the portrait of Florence Owens Thompson. I intended mm -hmm. to create a character um, named uh, Mary Coyne. So no, I did not. Okay, thank you. Uh, Jim actually asks, how did you choose the name Mary Coyne? Oh, um, you know, I don't even know how names come to me. Uh -huh. and, and, I, and I often try to not have names that are kind of meaningful, you know, like Charles Dickens names that are always have such wonderful you know, significance and meaning. And I, I I, kind of don't want that because I don't want a name to sort of become a character in my mind. And yet I chose Mary Coyne. And then of course it became really meaningful because she in fact became currency. She was on a stamp, <laughs> uh, you know, a US stamp and she became currency. And, and I mean, the, the photograph is owned by the government, you know, so it's not something that you could, you could get a copy of it, but um you know, in certain ways, she became um, a kind of currency. So it was a funny, you know, it, it was a name that ended up having sort of metaphorical meaning, even though it's not my intention to do that. Mm -hmm. Okay, we have another one over here. Mm -hmm. Oh, I thought I saw your hand. I'm sorry. It's another Jim asking about names. <clears throat> the name Walker Dodge, for, first of all, where did that first name come from? Uh, did it come out of out of the blue, or because there's a connection with Dorothea Lang? Oh, okay. And, and also, uh, where did he? When did he arrive in the narrative for you? When did you add him to it? Was he there from the beginning? Um, those are great questions. Uh, Walker is just a name that came to me. There's no significance that I knew of, but I, you do, so that I can't wait to hear. <laughs> um, and uh, he arrived right off the bat. You know, I knew that it was the story of these two women, but I also knew that it was the story of about it was something I, about history, too, and about how we re recreate and um, kind of how we how we find history from the tiniest shreds of information. Um, so that character was there from the get go and um, how he interfaced with the the, the characters was something that developed over the course of my writing him. But I, I don't know why, you know, that just, it felt like I, here's a, a guy who's a teacher whose subject is trying to recreate the past from these, you know, kind of more tactile uh, details that you find. And instead of, you know, histories of wars and battles and, um, and then his kind of interface with the story he became in a certain sense, I mean, not a doppelganger for me by any means, but sort of a, 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 a doppelganger for some of the overall thinking that I was doing about the, the idea of writing about these two women. Thank you. I was so curious about whose ideas about history you aligned yourself with the most. And, and uh, thank you for sharing that. I actually have a couple of questions I'm combining here. And uh, I was thinking myself about your craft. I'm really interested in when you were writing these three characters, 
Did you uh, write in a more linear fashion where you wrote every one person's story all the way through and then moved to another character and then uh, sequence them later? Or was there a different method? Well, the method was I, I wrote, <laughs> I wrote, I kept switching between characters. I think, it, you know, when I didn't know where to keep going with one, I would jump to the next, write a little bit of that. And then suddenly it would occur to me. Um, and then what I, and then it was kind of a curious thing how the, what the what the structure became was was the challenge and um you know what i did was i wrote all the scenes out separately on three by five cards and then i kind of like put them on the floor and kept rearranging them and trying to see what how, how they laid out against one another and whether certain scenes butted up next to another scene created a certain momentum or feeling or, or, or meaning versus another. And it was just sort of a, it was almost like creating a collage, you know, and, and trying to figure out uh, what happens when you put the blue and the green together or what happens when the green and the red are together, you know, what is the color that comes in the middle, that kind of liminal color. Um, so that was the, how I did it. And, and it was, um, you know, there were times when I structured it so that I was moving between the characters in very short spurts. Um, and that felt unsatisfying to me as a reader, because I could never get involved in the story of one or another character. So it ended up being sort of lengthier um, sections for each character. Right. And I'm wondering, I've heard of authors using that index card method. And I wonder if you work that way as a filmmaker, if it was a bit like storyboarding or if that was something that came from your film life I don't or not think so much. So. I, I don't think yeah. so. I mean, it really was sort of the, um, and every book has its different challenges. And the challenge of this was how do I interleave these three storylines in a way that um, keeps Keep, kept me engaged and hopefully then the, the reader. Um, so no, I think it was just sort of what felt, what, what the challenge of this particular story was. Okay. Thank you. So I, hmm, okay. There are some spoilers here in these questions and I'm going to just hope that, that people here have read the book or now you'll be intrigued to do so. Um, <laughs> but the question from John D is, when did you decide that Mary Coyne would return baby number seven to the Dodge household. That's a very big spoiler. Um, I know, right? I was like, <laughs> um, I know. I was like, should I ask I, it? But I want to know the answer. I'm being selfish. Well, I'll tell you, I I think as I wrote it, you know, I mean, I tend to not know where my stories are going. I, I don't project forward very much. I'm not someone who storyboards the whole, you know, plot of the story and then writes. I kind of you know, take the next step and then, and then I see what should happen next. And so I don't think I figured it out until I was there, you know, figure I mean, once she'd had that baby and then I thought, okay, what happens to that baby? Um, and then I understood the connections between the Walker story and that, you know, I think it, it all happened kind of as I was doing it. I mean, I think, I think my method is, you know, justified only because I am not particularly good at plot. That's not something that comes to mind easily. I am, you know, character comes to mind easily, situation, um, emotion, emotional arcs. But uh, so I really kind of take one step, see where I am, take the next step. Right. Well, Walker had to connect with the Coin family in some way at some point. And so that was um, perfect. And I actually had a connected question about your choices. And, and perhaps it, you don't necessarily have a rhyme and reason for it. But I noted that with George, so you changed the gender of the baby from the photo, it was actually Norma, um, who was George. And then one detail that really stood out to me was that uh, she had trouble nursing that seventh baby, uh, George. And yet in the migrant mother photo, you see, you know, there's there were six photos, I believe, in total, where the mother is nursing. I mean, that's a big part of that mythos mm -hmm. and, and what came to us as iconic. And so I, I wondered about the struggling with the nursing, the switching of the gender, if those choices meant something more to you, or were they just to serve the story? I shouldn't say just, but um, maybe you know what I'm getting at. Yeah, I, I guess I'm just well, asking about your choice. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think all all through the novel, the 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 choice I made was to use the real the real story as a kind of jumping off point for an imagined story, 
And although I used a certain facts that actually occurred, you know, that are uh, about Vera, about Dorothea Lange and about Florence Owens Thompson, um, I really, my intention was not to write um, a kind of fa a fictional of fact, you know, that was not my intention. My intention was to sort of imagine on top of fact. And so um, I think with my story, because I finally decided that the baby would need to be given back, given away, that 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 part of it would have to do with her inability to nurse him. Um, so, um, you know, so that that's, you know, it's funny the the cover of the book is is not the whole photograph, right? First of all, it's colorized, and second of all, it's cropped, and that was really intentional as a way of suggesting that this is not, you know, the the fictionalization of a true story. This is an, an imagine this is an imagination imaginative uh, piece of work that sort of takes as a base something in history, but that it's really imagined. Right. And and very truthfully rendered for its time in many ways. Uh, you know, you, you tap at a truth of a woman's experience, I think, beautifully uh, in the choices you have made. I think the audience might be interested to know that Dor um, Florence Owens Thompson went on to have three more children after the seven that she actually did raise. So she ended up with 10 children uh, in total in, in terms of the that was just too many children for me to name like <laughs> yeah i mean it's incredible it's incredible what she what she accomplished in her life it's amazing right. and um yeah i i you know i i was i mean when i was started to write the book i thought well i i know these facts about these women's lives i mean there's much more to know about dorothea lang than there is about florence owens thompson but but i don't know what they felt and if i'm going to write a book um that embodies them that that make uh, kind of claims feelings and emotions that aren't necessarily accurate to these women i need to take the leap and be in an imagined territory mm -hmm. which is why i didn't call them dorothea lang and mm -hmm. uh florence owens thompson yeah and and you took liberties with gender and you you created real children and i knew this when i saw them as a middle-aged or older adults uh at the end and they each had this fully formed personality with Trevor being one way and Ellie the other. And I realized how much I cared. And I really felt like, oh, good, I get to know what happened and who married who and what happened. And I realized just my level of investment with these children was so real. I think you've really created something beautiful with the six that you did pursue and look at. So, so thank, thank you. you. <laughs> That's a huge compliment. You know, when I was researching the um, book, I saw the photograph that was taken by the uh, the newspaper reporter who came out to do the story, and and he of course posed older yes. uh, Florence Owens Thompson in a, in a chair outside with two of her daughters on either side of her, sort of a, a kind of you know an imitation of the photograph. And what struck me was these, and it was I think it's two of the daughters was the vitality of these women, the strength of their faces, and you know that that gave me a clue to who these women had be, who these people had become. I mean, they, they are, uh, you know, survivors in a big way and, and kind of alive, you know, I mean, I don't know. I was just so struck by that. I mean, par partially because again, we all think of, you know, the, this poor woman as a victim and yet not at all. She was this, you know, the, the, she raised a family of strong, alive, vital people. That is beautiful. I've seen the photo. Um, it's it's available online to see. And it's actually three daughters in the photo where you have the two that you mentioned on either side. And then Norma, who is the baby in the photo, is, is kneeling on the ground and holding her mother's hand to indicate that she was the baby in the photo. And I, too, was struck by how vibrant they were. And interestingly, Florence is actually posed with her chin in her hand, trying to recreate the same pose. And there's such, I'd say, pride almost in her face and a willingness to go through with that pose. I suspect that at some point in her life, I'd like to imagine that she was pleased in, on some level or in some way with um, being a part of this, this piece of American history as we know it. 
So we will never know. We'll never know. <laughs> and that, and that, that is one of the things that intrigued me about writing this book, because we look at that and we say, you know, oh, maybe she was pleased and maybe this is a moment of pride. You know, we we don't really know. I mean, she was sick. She she this is, you know, her her daughter had written, I think, to the newspaper reporter. And um, so there's a lot more going on there. And I, I wouldn't I, I it's it's nice to think that. But I think the point or at least the point for me writing the book was to say, what was she thinking at that moment when her photograph was taken? You know, what were the complicated things that were going on in her mind and in her life? Because we don't know. And the one thing that we really don't know um, is what happens when a photograph is taken of us that lives on in, in that way, you know, and, and, uh, you know, we all are so used to having our photographs taken, but we don't really have the experience of, you know, something going viral. I mean, as it were, um, and how, what that, you know, it's really taken out of, out of your hands. I mean, the, once a photograph is taken, it's something's taken out of your hands as well, but to have it go on to have that kind of life is, it could, you could be proud of it. You could feel disenfranchised by it. You could feel erased by it. You could feel a million things. And that was why I wrote the book because I wanted to right. find out. Right. Right. Uh, yes. Hi, and thanks for doing this. Um, I'm trying to, I'm thinking about the creative process for creating characters for a novelist. And I'm wondering, I wonder to myself, is it, is it just keen observation? Is it recognizing different pieces and parts of ourselves and putting them into, like projecting it into the characters I create? Have you ever thought about, it's kind of like the psychology of creating characters. Does that make any sense? Yeah. I mean, that's, you know, that that's 98% of the whole thing. Um, not an easy thing to answer, but I think what I do, one of the things I think about a lot when I create characters is that I will invent a character and the first thing I will know about them might be something visual. It might be, I might hear their voice. I might, I don't know what, you know, some small thing. It's, and it's kind of like when you meet a real person and, and you say you meet them at a party and you learn very, a couple of sketchy things about them, right? And you have a sense of them, but then you meet them again and maybe they behave in, in a way that um, surprises you based on what you knew. And so then your idea of them has to complexify and then you meet them a third time or you go on a walk with them and suddenly something else happens that, that makes what you thought about them um, have to get more complicated. So that's what it's like for me, you know, writing a character is that I keep re-meeting them every time I write them. And, and as they do, or as I have them do or say, or behave, then I think, oh, okay, well, maybe they're more, they're not quite what I thought. There's something else, you know? I mean, I'm being, I'm talking in kind of vague attitudes, but I mean, in vague ways, but, you know, so writing a character isn't for me, isn't just saying, okay, these are the seven traits of this character and that's who it is. It's sort of wa watching them. I say watching them behave in the situations that I put them in. I mean, I say watching them behave, I'm writing them, but you know, in a sense, I'm watching them behave and then allowing all the contradictions to be held within that character so that they're not just seven traits, but they're a hundred thousand traits. Mm -hmm. Nice, hundred thousand traits. <laughs> okay, uh, let's see. Maybe there are some more Zoom questions over here. Let's see. Uh, all right. So it appears you are a musician. How did the lyrics of Woody? <laughs> I, I, I this is not my question, okay? <laughs> but <laughs> um, it, it appears you are a musician. How did the lyrics of Woody Guthrie affect your book? <laughs> That's very funny. Um, I am the least of the musicians in my family, but my husband is a, a, a wonderful pianist and my sons are musicians and I am very slowly and, and poorly learning the piano. So Woody Guthrie, you know, doesn't really, my, I don't know why that book is up here. I, I, it's someone else's book, but, um, 
So I love Woody Guthrie. I, you know, I, I don't know that much about the life story of Woody Guthrie. So it doesn't, doesn't, but, but music is a big part of my family's life. So it's a part of my life too. Great. Thank you. So uh, some more from the Zoom. Uh, this is a really interesting one from Shirley. Do you think it is possible for art like literature to raise social justice issues like the unhoused or children and parents separation at the border or like the unhoused or children and parents separated at the border? I suppose, um, you know, you can take that in a few different directions because art and literature do raise social justice issues, but perhaps you can talk a little bit about that vis-a-vis um, -vis your book. Sure. I mean, absolutely. I mean, I think that literature can uh, ap beautifully, uh, you know, um, illustrate, point, uh, excavate, expose social justice issues. Um, there are so many books. I mean, I'm just thinking about a book about the border. That I, I don't remember the name of it, but it's by a woman named Va Valeria Lu Luiselli, who wrote a book, I think, a year and a half ago or so the, about the border, which is supposed to be, I mean, I read it, it's quite good. Um, so yes, and I think from time immemorial, I mean, Dickens was writing, you know, Bleak House about, you know, social justice issues. Um, books can also have nothing to do with social justice issues and be fine, you know, and be brilliant and and important. And I, I guess I feel like, um, for novels that tackle social justice issues from my my for me um i i'm always drawn to novels that embody a character and characters in in a situation and that have an emotional component i think that for me drives the issues home more strongly than something that's kind of polemical you know or or idea driven i think that that might be more the province of a nonfiction book um, but, uh, absolutely. And then, you know, you know, as I said, you know, there are books about family and books about, you know, love and books about all sorts of things that might not necessarily be obviously about social issues. Um, but they're part of our lives and they're part of the fabric of our, you know, love is a part of the fabric of our lives, family, everything. So yeah, absolutely. I mean, Mary Coyne, um, uh, you know, very obviously is about a particular um, time in, in economics and it's about class and it's about um, what happens to people who have no resources and who are overlooked um, and have, uh, you know, no, no one's picking them up from the bottom and helping them up. Um, it's, but I hope that those issues come through because it's a, involving an emotional story of particular characters. It makes so much sense that you're so character driven in the way that you write and experience your book yourself, because th I think that's our experience as readers of your book as well. And there's this lovely question here from Bob. He writes, the spoken voice of Mary Coyne is superbly realized in your novel. Her cadences, her wit, her strength and individual courage are so vivid. Did you model her speech patterns on real people? That's, that is a great question. Um, no, no, not at all. Um, I think when I write, I get so deeply in, engaged in a character that I sort of, I hear the way they talk. I hear the the pattern of their speech. I hear the rhythm. I hear how they would respond to something, what would rankle them, what would make them feel moved. Um, it's, I mean, I'm, a terrible actor and I would never, you know, pretend to, but I think in a funny way, writing is a, you're kind of acting all the, all the roles in your mind. And, you know, there's a, almost like a, a trance-like quality when I'm writing where I'm so deeply immersed in a character that I feel like any move that I make is, is right for her, you know, how she moves and how she talks. And, you know, so I, I think that, um, and that's part of going back to the question about character. I mean, it takes a long time for me to really feel like I am inside of a character. It doesn't happen when I first start writing them. It doesn't happen six months into writing them. It happens two and a half years into writing them where I feel like I get, I get her, I get what is really driving her. I get the deeper, 
you know, the, all, all the layers of emotion that run much more deeply than the obvious. It takes a really long time. But thank you for that. And thank you for the kind compliment. Yeah. Well, we've, um, as you said earlier, there's so much more known about Dorothea Lange than Florence Owens Thompson. And we haven't really talked much about Vera, um, but I just completely was uh, taken by her. And so um, Paul asks, how did you learn about and develop the photographer's story and thoughts? Was there anything specific and unique about writing, say, Vera as opposed to Mary? I imagine there was. And then what was that for you? Sure. Um, well, as as you said, there is a there is a ton to know about Dorothy Lang. There's biographies, two really wonderful biographies about her. Um, there's film of her talking, um, and and so that's kind of amazing to be able to sort of just hear her talk and see her move and see her, you know, how she she forms her language. Um, there's many people writing about her work and about that photograph in particular. So there was a ton for me to to look to read. Um, and I think I created the character both, you know, as a combination of of the things that had happened to her in her life that I captivated me and kind of sent me in my into my imagination. Um, but then again, you know, as I said before, I imagined her. You know, I don't know what Dorothea Lang felt. I don't know how she talked or what she did. I know how my character, did. So I kind of used, you know, I always used to think of it as sort of like, um, uh, what's, you know, I was, I was like using, using the, 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 the facts and then just embroidering on the facts. You know, I was thinking about how Dorothea Lange had polio. We know this. I, and we know that, um, it said that her father left her for instance. And so I think giving an emotional life to that, it was very natural to imagine how she may have grown up with those kinds of experiences. And you really just enliven that emotional piece um, in ways that very much match to me with the facts of what we do know about Dorothea's life. So so that was, was very resonant. And, um, you know, moving for a moment from that to setting, uh, there's this really interesting question from Albina. She says, in your research of characters, particularly Mary, did you travel to the locations where she lived to imagine how she may have experienced her circumstances? And if so, how long was the process in writing the book? So there's a two part there. Sure. Well, the book took about mm, two and a half to three years to write. Um, I definitely went uh, all over the Central Valley um, where she did a lot of her traveling and 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 working in the fields um san francisco a little bit um i did not go to oklahoma where she's from i've been to oklahoma but i didn't go there um i used a lot of you know photography and and um you know one thing that when you're writing something historical um the the being being there in a modern place it can give you a sense of the land but it doesn't give you a sense of the buildings and the you know how people lived so photographs in some ways were equally as important as being there um but i think being in central california where i've spent you know more i live in california as you all do so you know we've all driven through and gone to um yeah to 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 sort of look at those fields and see the you know feel the air and see the colors and um, and then start imagining. The other great thing about going to these places was that there's always, when you go to little towns, there's often like a visitor center. And sometimes in the visitor center, there are these sort of homemade histories that people have self-published. And I found those to be the most uh, treasured research uh, tools for me, because in those histories, people talk about their individual lives and they talk about how their mother made, you know, this meal out of when she didn't have enough food or uh, what car they drove or what games they play. They remember playing. And those are the kind of details that become are, are really, for me, much more important than what you can learn in a textbook. Um, so, yeah, driving around those areas became, you know, important to me in, in many, many ways. 
So now that you've shared that, I'm thinking to this, I think it's the penultimate scene, or it might be the final scene when Walker and Alice, I think Walker and Alice's relationship is one of the dear, dear relationships in this book. And when they go to the Nipomo, I, I might be saying it incorrectly, I'm sorry, but the Nipomo uh, Visitor Center at the end, and they're looking at the um, histories that you just described. Uh, was that taken from some of your experiences in the Central Valley when you wrote that scene about them going and researching and exploring more and getting the T-shirt and, and that whole piece? Yeah, I mean, I went there. I don't think any of those things happened. So I think I made them up. But I did go there. And, you know, you they don't know where that photograph was taken. No one exactly knows, I don't think, or at least they didn't. No one was telling me. Um, so, uh, yeah. But I mean, again, I, you know, I I made all that made all that up but yes they were at one of those visitor centers that I love right 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 okay so we have uh, another question here uh by um Patricia did you feel like your characters drove your scenes or did you envision scenes and put your characters in them um that is a fantastic writing question and the answer is both I mean I think you know, I would say, okay, I want to have some scenes at a, a lumber mill. You know, there's a section of the story that takes place in a, when Mary and her, her husband, Toby go work in, in, in uh, felling trees and, and Toby's cutting lumber. So I, I knew I wanted to be in that environment. And then I thought, okay, well, what, what could happen in that environment? Well, she has to make a home. What kind of home is it going to be? Um, he has to go to work. What does he do for work? then I want to research how they did get the trees out of the forest and how they did cut the lumber and what, how they did send it off. And so then those, those things become scenes because suddenly the children want to go see dad at work and there's a scene and, and, you know, a train comes in to take the logs away and, and there's a scene. So um, it's kind of a combination of both. It's, it's the, the place often provokes scene ideas. And then I'm also moving a story forward. So I have to figure out how, certain things can happen in that environment. She had to have another child during that period of time. Um, they had to figure out, they had to leave. I had to figure out why they ended up leaving. Um, so, so it's kind of a combination of both. Nice. So I think we have time for uh, maybe one more question. Yes. I would like to know, I know this isn't about Mary Coyne. I know this we're talking about today, tonight, but can you tell us a little bit about your latest book because I haven't read it and I would love to know a little bit about it because your writing is so excellent I'd like to read it yes that would be great um it's called the mysteries and it takes place in the midwest and it is a story really about a seven-year-old girl and um uh her experience of loss and it's about kind of an awakening for a seven-year-old girl. It, it involves her parents and, and another set of, of adults. Um, so, and, and there are sections of the book like Mary Coyne told from different points of view, but it, in, the, in the, the meat of it is about sort of a, a very early coming of age for a, a young girl who sort of suddenly has to confront some of life's uh, bigger uh, questions like life and death. So that's what that story is about. Oh, wow. Okay. I think we have some very interested readers uh, for that book here. So um, you've the time has just flown by. This has been amazing. I want to share this beautiful compliment. Um, it Not a question from someone in our Zoom gallery. She wrote, Maria writes, I haven't read your novel yet, but I'm very intrigued to read it now more than ever. I'm very glad my history teacher told me about your presentation. So thank you, history teacher for sharing about that. And thank you so much, Marissa, for joining us to this evening to give us more insight into both your process and uh, these little sort of nuggets of behind the scenes and, and what this um, real labor of love has been like for you and exploration and discovery. And, um, you know, I'm thinking about how Walker, uh, at the end, it ends with a different photograph that he takes of his daughter, Alice. And uh, she doesn't like it. She, she wants to trash it. And then he points out that it will live on in some cloud and there is no erasure. And I just, you know, we go from his initial 
uh, cynicism about uh, the digital world. And and he's not the most tech savvy person, but then he has this uh, sort of um, observation at the end that there is no erasure. And he means it very literally because, you know, photos live on, as you know, um, and go viral, etc. But I wonder if you had a closing thought. I, I'm sure you have many and, and, and that it's very layered, but but some sort of closing thought to share with us about something you came away with um, that maybe got channeled through walker maybe not um yeah i mean i think it's it's exactly that which is that um history is past but it never goes away and that it exists in you know the textbooks and it exists in that uh self-published uh memoir by a person in a little town with a visiting center and it exists in when you go to an antique store and you look through those boxes of old photos and there's a old photo of some person, right? Who is that person? What is their story? Why are they leaning against the wall looking like that? Um, and I think that um, that's, that's something that, you know, matters to me a lot is the way in which we, um, we hold on to the path, the, what happened to us as a, as a, people, you know, and that it it matters and that things that we do on this earth, big things and tiny things have huge repercussions. So I think that's what matters to me about and what one of the reasons why I wrote that book. Beautiful. Thank you. You you. know, um, thank you so much. Well, thank you for having me. It's been a treat and I really yes. appreciate everyone's yeah. questions. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Walker says at the end that inert um, answers are inert things that stop inquiry and that um, you're never finished looking and that um, there are always discoveries that will turn everything you know on its head and will make you ask all over again, who are we? And I think that really speaks to what you shared with us just now. So you've left us with as many questions as answers tonight, and we're going to go and read um, more of your work. So thank you very much for joining us. Thank you to our Zoom audience for all your amazing questions (laughs) that really fed and enriched all of us. Thank you, all of you, for coming. And we hope to see you at future events based on Mary Coyne. We have art, we have collage making, we have music. Uh, Beginning with this Sunday at Mount Calvary Lutheran Church, we have songs of the Great Depression. So including Woody Guthrie. So so hope to see you there. And thank you again, Marissa. Thanks, everybody. Bye.